Sam Robertson, welcome to the Pace. Welcome back to the Pace Performance Podcast. I feel like I'm harassing you. Yeah, thank you for having me. <laughs> no, don't worry. Don't worry. It's great to have you back on. I know we've spoken a lot over, well, what seems like a lot over the last few months, which has been great. It's, it's good to finally get you back on. So thanks for uh, thanks for giving up some of your evening after what sounds like a very busy day. But anyone that wants to know a little bit more about you, I know we've done a previous episode of the podcast, so people could dive back there but I don't even know how long ago it was it's it feels like a long time ago um but do you want to give us a bit of bio a bit of background on you well I've got less hair I know that and I've probably got more gray in my beard as well and I don't Likewise. think you were even doing video back in those days so I things wasn't. have changed dramatically <laughs> and my bio probably has changed these days I'm not sure I was probably working in Australian football at the time so I guess these days I am confined to the university in Australia, particularly the last couple of years, but I'm, I'm fortunate enough to still do various things in applied sport. So I manage most of the uh, sports applied sports partnerships for Victoria University here in Melbourne, Australia. And when I have a little bit of time, I, I still enjoy doing some research and consultancy in my, I guess, area of somewhat expertise in uh, analytics, in particular decision-making of athletes and sporting uh, organizations so that keeps me pretty busy i always feel slightly nervous when i have someone who's actually got a podcast of their own that's another thing that's changed got a podcast of your own it it has and it was not something i envisaged running as long as it has although it's still very much in its infancy compared to you but i have enjoyed it and it's it's forced me to read outside my area and research outside of my area which has been fantastic and i'm probably past the stage now of tapping close colleagues on the shoulder to come on the show and starting to meet new people, which is fantastic as well. So it's very rewarding. It's a lot of work, as I'm sure you know, but it's it's very rewarding. This is, again, maybe out of the scope of what we're going to discuss for the like next 45 minutes or so. <clears throat> Excuse me, but how do you how do you identify... This is, what, again, this is a question that I get. How do you identify the guests that you have on? Is it a personal thing? Is it you see things crop up and you think that's something we should dig into a little bit further? How do you choose guests? Well, I think... Further to what I said in my bio there a little bit, I am really fortunate in being able to to travel around the place and work in a number of different sports. That's the beauty of analytics and decision making. It it really doesn't matter what sport it is. And so of course I'm also having the interaction with university and government and these types of organizations as well. And so what that does, of course, is it exposes you to all the types of problems that people are dealing with all over the world and what they're interesting uh, what they're interested in as well. So that means that you meet people that you might might want to connect with and i think the very first episode for example the very first guest we had on the show was someone i'd met two weeks earlier so you do run into people that you feel like may be really suitable for the show so it's a bit of a mix of both and i certainly don't see us running out of topics anytime soon like like yourself but uh what's been a little bit different there is obviously we've made it very much about the topics rather than the guests so that's always a little bit of an ego check i guess for some people that they are coming on to talk about one specific area rather than them themselves interesting nice well like i said the next 45 minutes slightly different a slightly different setup to what we'd maybe normally do and the the topic I want to go down is, is sports technology. I'm going to get you back in a second to define what sports technology actually is. Maybe a simple question, but pretty more complex than, than we actually think. But I've been involved in, in sports tech no way as long as, as long as you have. But maybe on the other side, on the on the company side, on the on the organization side, and always had frustrations around salespeople and sports scientists, pretty to a lesser extent, but more often not than salespeople, creating stories around the other, the competitor. So for my, my, my experience was, I was at Catapult and we always had a big um, competitor in stat sports. And there was this to in and fro in with who's doing what, who's better at what, and these kind of industry like hearsay of of what they're doing bad and little stories that you can kind of grab hold of and then tell the clients that you know that they're doing something bad and we're doing something better and it's just like this is I don't know this is the same in any industry because people are people are chasing business I, I completely get that but I always thought why is there not something that is a bit more objective 
that can decipher the information that is coming from Stat Sports and coming from Catapult. Again, just using us as an example. But that's something that you guys have done since me leaving Catapult with, with FIFA. But then it still leads me to, okay, now we've got force plates. Now we've got, and a classic example now is Aura Ring and Whoop. The two going head to head with the, the, the consumer wearable there. So I want to frame this this episode around around sports tech and and that area of not objectifying but increasing the transparency around what is collected, which which at the end of the day is to help the user understand what has been generated from that the technology. But coming back to that after that little rant, what is sports tech? How do we define what sports tech actually is? Well, to throw another spanner in the works to start, I don't think there is a universal definition. I mean, from the strict letter of the law, it would be anything that is attached or augmented to the the naked human body or the, the, the human body in its purest form. So back in the old days, you would have termed a pen and paper being used for notational analysis. Tom Riley sitting in the stands at Everton Football Club taking notes would have been termed as sports technology these days of course that's not the what we think of when we when we come to test sports technology but of course it it does extend and when you really sit down and think about it it extends all the way from the obvious things like new types of shoes tracking companies that you mentioned there uh formula one cars of course these are types of things that come to mind but of course in the last couple of decades we've seen a real rise in things like athlete management systems and computerized methodology automation these are things that are becoming optical tracking is another good example things that are becoming very pervasive so it is incredibly broad and it's probably best to categorize it into different uh, types but also different use cases and uh, we can talk about that as we go through but it can be as broad as you like and i think probably the really advanced organizations and FIFA would be one of those are starting to do that in the way that they deal with different types of technology. And for example, the area that we work mainly with FIFA in is, is around um, EPTS. So electronic performance tracking systems. And of course that is typically GPS systems or GNSS systems, uh, optical tracking systems and local positioning systems. And of course, eventually that will extend and there'll be new types of those over, over the journey as well. So why did FIFA decide to do that and use and why was that area chosen as the, the first place to start for them? Well, it's it's the biggest sport in the world, obviously, and there's obvious reasons about why an organization might choose to do that in terms of safety, reproducibility, consistency across tournaments, consistency across leagues. But I think if you talk to FIFA, and I don't want to put words in their mouth, but I'm fairly confident in saying this, that a big part of this would be what they would call a democratization of of data and democratization of technology and access to technology across their member organizations. If you think about football being the biggest sport in the world, I'm not sure how many member nations there are of FIFA, but it's I think it's almost as many as there are countries in the world. We're pushing 200. And of course, some of those countries are very resource rich and can access permanent setups of all sorts of different technology and then others in other regions of the world have none whatsoever. So it's not only for, for them the remit around safety, but also this notion of not so much equal access, but equitable access for different uh, organizations and member countries, member nations around the world. So was that FIFA project, did some of that have the consumer, it's not the consumer, but the user or the, the nation in mind to be able to decipher what system they should be using? Was that part of the I think that's certainly where it's, where it's evolved now. I mean, okay. if you look at the way, and I'm far from an expert on this, but if you look at the way in which some of these nations have set up football in their country, uh, some of them have been quite clever in the way that they've either, I'm not going to use the word copy, but they've maybe piggybacked off what some of the other nations have done really well. And, out of the, and it's not just nations, it's leagues, of course, as well. And I, I won't name specific examples, even though I've got a few in my head, but I, I think that's certainly part of it. And again, that's that's if you look at it, it, it doesn't serve FIFA well to have Germany, the United States, the United Kingdom, these areas 
continuing to get richer and get better and get more advanced in their technology. The, and, and it's not so much those countries, it's more probably the professional leagues in those countries, whereas areas in, throughout Asia and Africa not not thriving. So I think when we talk about democratization and standardization as well of data formats, it's another part of it, which we probably won't talk about too much today, but it's all of that is geared towards not only retaining that quality or maintaining that quality, but also allowing those other nations to be very clear about where the standard is and, and also maybe allowing them a little bit of time to catch up. One little story that comes to mind and I'll, I'll show that <clears throat> I'll explain the reason for, uh, for telling it, but it's the, the return on investment for, for these clubs that are investing in whatever can, can, uh, type of technology it is. And I remember going to a um, Preston North End with Tom Little. don't know if you've come across Tom. And I was going in because their catapult, Tom's a big catapult guy. He'd used catapult for a while. I'd gone in to sort the deal out for their next subscription. So we we are in there with a the finance guy who I who I'd converse with with Tom. We were going through the numbers. It was all fine, all going okay. They were going to sign up to the next uh, the next deal with the promise of the next device that was going to be, which I think now is Vector, as part of the deal when that came out. Then there was a knock at the door, and Peter Ridsdale comes in. Who don't know if you've heard of Peter, but he was the chairman. Big guy, quite an imposing guy. He was at Leeds United when they were in the Champions League in the early 2000s and was has been kind of finger-pointed for the, their demise because of overspending and whatnot. So it's quite a, a big character in football. And he came in, sat down, and basically threw the meeting absolutely upside down. And he said, how do I know that your next device that you've promised us is going to be the best one? What if another company comes and brings out a better one and we're in a three-year contract with you? So I'm like put on the spot, completely thrown off in this meeting. But it comes back to the return investment. How do I, as a company, or as a, as a Tom Little, as a head of sports science, say to the chairman, These, this is how we've actually measured the return investment that we've got previously with Catapult. Therefore, it's important for us to invest again in this next device or next bit of technology. And that's, I suppose, the next question to you is from your experience, how are clubs, how are individuals actually trying to understand the return investment for you know thousands and thousands of pounds or dollars that have been invested by clubs in these bits of technology? Well, I'm always careful in making blanket statements, but I'll make a somewhat... Not, I don't think it's particularly controversial, but I'll make a somewhat provocative one here. Is and I would say across the board, it could be a hell of a lot better. And the example that you gave then is, in my mind, completely and utterly the on the onus of the club to answer that question. That shouldn't be directed okay. at a manufacturer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now a savvy manufacturer would probably have an answer to that question, and because it's yes. probably in their best interest to do so. I was but not savvy in that point. <laughs> you weren't. All right. Well, <laughs> yeah. maybe you're intimidated. <laughs> I was. I was. And I mean, you use the word transparency before, and in, in in what technology is providing and its accuracy, its its validity. But even in that, there's incredible nuance. And so, if we look at like a term like validity, which is thrown around in in scientific terms and, and, and in sport for that matter, all over the place. You've got all sorts of different nuance in that as well. So we have validity in terms of you're asking whether a player has hit 36 kilometers per hour in a, in a football match. Is that accurate or not? Or was it really 34 and a half? And maybe there's a little bit of error in that. And of course, we want to know what that error is. We want to know whether the error is more at high velocities or lower velocities. But of course, You've got other areas of validity as well, which is, is that data actually meaningful? And that's not really the responsibility of the manufacturer to sort out. I mean, you could argue that it is to an extent. If they are reporting on 100 things and only 10 of them are of any use, then maybe that's a, a cause to, to look at their business model a little bit. But quite frankly, that can differ in the eye of the beholder as well. So if you're a... And, and you see that as well. You talk to any major sporting league in the world and you talk to multiple organizations, some will value different metrics from a tracking company as opposed to another. And it's the same with the information they might get off a force plate. And so already we're at two kind of layers of validity here. And then when you talk about value, 
which is exactly what you referred to in the example there. Well, that's neither of those things because you need to act on the information in order for it to provide value. And the manufacturer can't do that for you. And that's the onus is on your staff. And in fact, it's not even on your staff. It's on your decision makers to pick up the information that's provided to them, hopefully in a user-friendly format that frames a question in an appropriate way. You then act on that information and that provides the ROI or the return on investment. And then, of course, you've got different layers there as well. You've got uh, relative to what you were doing beforehand. We were making decisions on which players to transfer, which players to sign before we had tracking systems. So what were we using to assess a player's speed or assess a player's fitness before then? Uh, I mean, I know the answer to that, but many people in football probably don't. They're too young to remember. So there's layer upon layer. Interesting. So <clears throat> as a, someone that consults for organizations and for people like FIFA, how would you, if, if you were asked that question by a club, how can we determine our, the return investment of the, this bit of technology that's cost, costing us $50,000 a year, whether it's worth $50,000 a year or we should just get another member of staff uh, or half member of staff to do X, Y, and Z? What would your guidance be for that organization or that person? Well, there's a, there's a number of different considerations there. I would probably start with what I just said then in terms of what are they doing now and what are they spending on it? Because we can fall into the habit of saying we're going to spend $50,000 on this new device and it needs to give us $50,000 of value. But of course, that's not true. You're, you're spending time and energy. I mean, sometimes it is. Sometimes you've never looked at a problem before and you decide to start looking at it. But most of the time, the new piece of technology or new methodology is coming in to replace something else. I would suggest the other thing that I see, and I hardly see anyone doing this well at all, is connecting it to multiple areas of the business. You occasionally hear about different stories of organizations saying, hey, we've got a new computer-based management system that will go halves in the cost of that with our marketing department upstairs with our football department or our athletic department and that'll attenuate the cost a little bit but what i'm talking about particularly in in things like metrics that come off tracking data and i'm sorry we, we're using that example a lot because of the example you gave earlier but mm. there's advantages there in fan engagement there's advantages and that could be in the stadium it could be on the website it could be all sorts of uh, different ways of engagement there's massive broadcast advantages there there's advantages for scouting. There's advantages for performance analysis and coaching, physical development. I mean, that's one of the reasons why that particular technology has become very pervasive and very popular. And I'm not saying that organizations aren't doing that. Of course, they're using it across those multiple areas, but quantifying the value in financial terms or in terms of how many people across the business are actually looking at it, it becomes a different story very quickly to this transactional nature that we, we kind of often go through our reviews or end of season reviews of departments and say, was this providing value or this company's giving us a $10,000 discount, we're going to go with them. It needs to be a little bit more broader than that. Because we're seeing more stuff on screen now, aren't we? I mean, the Super League final a couple of weeks ago here uh, in Rugby League and metrics are plastered on screen through again through catapult data but i'm sure other companies are doing exactly the same and not to say that was this example that i'm going to give is is relevant to that specific scenario but there is things that come up on screen and then you go on twitter and there's fan and then you go on twitter and it's toxic at the best of times but fans are getting carried away with one thing or don't understand another thing or when you're comparing two players there's like yeah, but he did this in, in this instance and there's just not the, the context around it. So is that a positive that we are trying to move that data into more fan engagement pieces? Like I said about the, the Super League and, and Catapult data on screen. Or is that creating more confusion? Is the things that organizations and leagues should be doing better to visualize that or put context around it? just interested in that fun engagement piece and if it's going the right way yeah i've probably flipped and flopped in this 
area over the last couple of years. I have gone from thinking it's a really bad idea to a good idea and somewhere in between. But over, overwhelmingly, I think it's a good idea. Uh, it, if you look at a lot of the, the ways in which, let's look at athlete development and the way that, again, staying on athlete tracking systems here in those field-based sports, the way in which they develop their athletes is incredibly similar. It's incredibly homogenous. And part of that is because they're all using the same data to inform that the way that they provide feedback on the way that design their training sessions. So if we keep that in mind, the the more that we get this type of data out into the public sphere, of course it's going to be misinterpreted by the fan and probably the chairman and probably the broadcaster. But that happens already with event data that we see in a lot of team sports. Uh, if you watch the most rudimentary football coverage of a, a World Cup and you see the possession stats they're still reported regularly across football or football codes around the world. Possession stats, uh, they don't mean a lot and they very rarely do. They very rarely give you an indication about who's winning a game. So we have that happening already. And so there has been that narrative saying, well, we're getting into the misrepresenting what's happening in a match, but it's already happening. And so if we come back to this idea of democratization of data, the more we can bring this out into the public sphere... And I understand that, of course, there are commercial sensitivities at time with, times with data. But the more we can bring that, this out into the public sphere, there's a very strong community. It's, it's not a large community, but there is a strong community of amateur analysts and amateur fans out there that will pick this up, some types of data, and come up with some very interesting ideas. Now, a lot of it won't be good, but some of it will. And, of course, this creates more variance or more variability in the types of things we see from this data. And the evidence is there for all to see. If you look at all the sporting codes around the world now, there's plenty of amateur analysts that have got on social media. Uh, and there was one two days ago I saw who all they did was create a great portfolio on social media. They now end up working at a professional football club somewhere in Europe. So it's see happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't remember who yeah. it was. I'd actually use their name if I knew who it was, if I remembered who it was. Yeah. But it's happening. It's happening all over the place. And actually, I do know who it is, and I know that you're, uh, you're a close colleague of them. Oh, I won't embarrass them by mentioning <laughs> who that person is. But the point remains, that can only be a good thing. Uh, we're getting more variety. That's Variety very rarely is going to equate to more boredom in anything it's going to be good it's the spice of life so i would i think overwhelmingly it's a good thing just come back to the value and it's a different scenario when we're talking about hardware and software in a catapult or a stat sport scenario player tracking than it is for an ams system obviously ams systems are everywhere and people seem to be that that seems to be the thing that is talked about a lot in terms of and in terms of um, actually making sense of the data that we're injecting into this. But one thing that's quite interesting in the GPS space or the player tracking space, you've got a couple of big players, three or four big players. In the AMS space, much more, much more spread, which says to me, and this is very, very basic, but says to me that there's not maybe one that, fits everyone's needs therefore there's this spread of of uh, of companies that are trying to provide these solutions but in terms of trying to understand the return investment or like you say the value of an ams is that a lot more complex than just a not just a but a player tracking system well i would say as a blanket response that yes it's extremely more co complex and when you think about how we would define the value of a piece of technology. There are, of course, there's characteristics and things that would be inherent to any piece of technology that if we put a blanket across a lot of them, we would want every piece of technology to have. And of course, then there's very specific characteristics to a certain type of category. We talked about categories at the start there that we might want to see in that particular category. And AMS, of course, many things that you would want in an athlete management system are quite different to what you would be looking for in an athlete tracking system. The There's no doubt, There's one of the reasons for that is there's more, I'm going to use the term degrees of freedom. And what I mean by that is there's more moving parts, I suppose, to an athlete management system that can be manipulated uh, there's probably more touch points if it's working well with that particular system in an organization as well in terms of staff and, and athletes. 
And it probably invokes a call to action a little bit more readily than a, an athlete tracking system as well. You've, you're kind of measuring player movement around a field or a court and then you've got to pick that data up and do something with it. An athlete management system is actually designed for that very purpose. It, it, you know, at the most rudimentary version of it, it, it can be just a glorified database. And I think we've seen them emerge from that in the last decade or so. But at their best right now, they're starting to look at really cutting edge things that we have seen stem out of things like behavioral economics in terms of can we nudge practitioners into certain actions in their daily practice? Can we use or can we design particular visualizations that cause the athlete or cause the end user, in this case a practitioner, to notice something on a screen? These are things that the big tech companies, Google and co, are looking at in terms of how they design things, Facebook or Meta, whatever they're called now. These are organizations <laughs> that that are doing this type of work. And so to see AMS companies doing this in sport is is incredibly uh, interesting. And of course, that's the, the real holy grail for them in terms of uh, can they be more than glorified repositories? Can they actually be a true, I mean, decision support system was the word I was going to use. That's a very, they've been around forever. But can they really be a, a true decision support system that is tied to informing the decision, helping to make decision, and then the part we always forget about, evaluating the decision later on? One thing that's always interested me is you do have com- like huge companies like SAP who are who are in this space, but why haven't the likes of Microsoft, Google, Intel, or whoever it may be, ventured into this area? Given how much leverage they can potentially glean from being involved with a I don't know Man- Manchester United or Dallas Cowboys or whoever it is to then filter down the pyramid, or have these guys tried to get involved or? had a little play and then and then backed out? Well, I don't know the answer to the last part of your question, but what I would say to the first part would be that it's probably not worth their while. So it's a really small market, uh, elite sport and professional sport, and typically they don't want to pay for anything either. So <laughs> they just want you to, they want you maybe to use their name in terms of getting some free gear i'm being a little bit flippant but the point is it's a very small market and if you look at the health area or the wellness area it's incredibly more lucrative because just frankly you're touching way way more people and so i think that would probably be the main reason yeah okay you mentioned frameworks a minute ago because that's some reason that's some work that you've done to try to understand this area a little bit better and create frameworks in various different like you say, categories of, of sports tech for people to potentially make, the right, make better decisions on on the, the data that they collect. Just tell us a little bit more about that. Well, it's probably worth starting with a little bit around the origins, uh, frankly, because it's certainly not something I can take credit for, uh, not alone at least. And it's also, I think, obviously people in research environments come up with that many frameworks sometimes you can hardly um, keep up with that many of them but in this case we've talked about it already in terms of this is well what we haven't talked about I, I suppose is how quickly this space is moving and so I often look around sometimes and say well how do we not know how to determine the value of this piece of technology or how do we not know how accurate it is and a lot of the times the answer is it's just moved too quick and we we weren't ready for it uh, either, and when I say we, governing bodies, clubs, organisation, universities, athletes, player associations, any of those. And so when we talk about developing a framework, really the origins of, of my interest in that, because I'm not a sports tech guy. I mean, we talked about it at the int- in introduction there. I've probably been forced there through, that's where a lot of the data that we deal with in our team comes from. So that's one of the reasons. And then just the incredible interest that I've noticed from people worldwide in this particular area. So you've got sports governing bodies. We've already talked about FIFA as a good example, wanting to ensure there's quality checks uh, for some of the reasons we've already mentioned, but also before they sign major commercial deals with new technology providers. For example, that's another reason why governing bodies would want to know the quality of something. You've got clubs out there playing 
God knows how many games in a competitive season. At the same time, they're getting probably every day a different technology company coming to them trying to sell them something. How do they have time to vet that? They don't. I mean, so they have got no option but to work with someone else or join collective forces to come together to try and solve that problem. So that's another consideration. And so I was talking to a lot of clubs and organizations wanting to do that. Uh, We know that there's been a rise of kind of athlete associations. Uh, I think probably the National Basketball Association in the US is the the most prominent example of that, of of real pushback on certain types of technology. Uh, You've got the manufacturers we've talked about already. Uh, The really forward-thinking ones or the savvy ones commercially are quite rightly seeking out ways in which they can validate whatever that means, (laughs) validate their product and get some feedback on that. And, of course, we've seen a real rise in the biggest accelerator of all has been this real rise in startup technology, in particular sport startup technology, where we're getting entrepreneurs, venture capitalists coming into sport, wanting to develop the latest and greatest uh, sports technology. And, And that's been a more recent involvement of mine in that area. And what I've noticed there is they get a lot of schooling, they get a lot of education around how to run a business, how to make money, how to create a valuation. They don't often they don't know the first thing about what a good technology looks like in terms of its accuracy and what's going to fly in the professional sport world. So that's a long-winded answer to your question, but the point is that's where my interest came from because I couldn't get away from it. Everyone was asking me about it. Everyone was wanting help with it. And so that's really led to where we are today in terms of starting to take that area a little bit more seriously and starting to put some time into it. So startups, that's an interesting area i'm guessing that you you like you said you work in so they're coming to you to try to understand like you say they've got the business savvy they've got the the potential um investment but they're actually coming to you to try to understand the tech better is that right well they're probably out of all those stakeholder groups i just mentioned then they're probably the one that aren't coming to us but they're the ones that need it the most and should (laughs) should do so it's an interesting hypothetical in terms of if we let the startup community run wild throughout professional sport, what would what would happen without a little bit of checks and balances? I, I think you would find, and this might sound dramatic, but I'm fairly sure this would happen, you would find there would be a high-profile incident, which is normally a catalyst for change, a high-profile incident of something going horribly wrong with some particular technology or some kind of ergogenic aid where some athlete has ingested something they shouldn't have and they drop dead on the court, heaven forbid. Something like that will probably happen. And that's always the catalyst for regulation and for change. And, of course, no one wants that. Uh, And so that's probably one example there with the startup community about where if I look at some of the main accelerator programs around the world that are playing around in the sports space, that's missing. If you go through their list of mentors or their program managers, most of them are entrepreneurs. And very few of them would know anything about sport. And, and that's that's fine. There's very good reasons about why they emphasize that. But it's very there's something to be said for subject matter expertise, I'd say. And it's not just about making your product better. It's about making sure you don't hurt people. You mentioned the NBA and the bit of a push, well, a lot of a pushback on the tech that can be used on, on players um, in games and in, in practice. Why did they, Why did they decide to do that? What's the infrastructure around that, if you if you do know? And do you think that is potentially a, going to be a catalyst for other leagues and organizations to do similar things? Well, I, I don't think I do know enough about the origins of it, although what I would say is, and again, I'm, I'm not trying to uh, brown nose the, the guys at FIFA, but I'm fairly sure they took a lot of inspiration from them in that particular respect. But, it, of course, they're very different to FIFA because... FIFA don't control a league per se. They're providing a, a you know governance across the sport, and so it becomes a little bit trickier for an organisation like the NBA to to control that when they're in a different different structure, I suppose. So I don't know enough about how that's going. Uh, I must confess, uh, but yeah, obviously when you're dealing with quite advanced organisations, uh, franchises sitting under the NBA with all their probably their own ideas about how things should be, I think you know if you hear some things down the line, they've, they've certainly hit some roadblocks along the line along the way. So with all them, just bringing this to a um, head a little bit here, with all them 
stakeholders that we've spoken about, the the companies themselves, the leagues, the organizations, the governing bodies, the universities, the people like yourself. Is there any talk within the industry? And there's a as you know, there's a reason I'm coming to this, but is there any talk in the industry to try to pull all this together to actually do something about it and create this um ecosystem, I suppose, to be able to help everyone and especially the the end user, the the sports scientist, the, the club who's investing in this technology. Is there any underlying chat that this needs to be done or is being done? There's an incredible amount of underlying chat and I did hint at it earlier. Yeah, and that's just that's just me. And I'm sure if you talk to other people who are in similar situations to myself, they would regale similar stories. The the interesting thing about it is that they all have things that they need which are the same and then they all have slightly different needs as well. And I, I gave some examples of that earlier. Uh, if you talk about a what a professional code needs, they want accurate data a, a lot of the time and, of course, they want it to be safe for their athletes and things like that. Uh, whereas, as again, we talk about a startup, they're really looking at it Sure, they'll take that stuff, but they're really looking at it so they can use it as a marketing tool and so they can sell it. And same with the manufacturer for that matter. But yeah, there's an incredible groundswell of uh, franchises. So, And I won't name them all here because there are too many to name that are really looking to make a splash in this space. Again, they're constrained by time, uh, time on task. It's not a major part of their roles. Even sports scientists at organizations, which really this would normally fall under their remit. They have very limited time in, in which to be able to do this type of work. If you look throughout the world, there's, and I will mention a couple of specific names here, there's a Sports Technology Research Network, which has really recently been started in Ghent by Christoph de May and his group. He's done a fantastic job, and I don't, know, I don't think he sleeps, in fact. He's doing that much work on this uh, to really drive that across Europe and Australia and, and the US as well. Uh, here in Australia, again, I think it's it's common knowledge that the Australian Institute of Sport has, has always tried to lead the way on this and they're continuing to, to do that. But even colleagues like uh, Jackie Alderson and Julia Powers at University of Western Australia, again, really caught up in this area, but not just what we've talked about today, but also the ethics around the data that comes from the technology. And of course, that's a whole other podcast altogether. But and of course, I'd like to think that we're we're slowly getting towards uh, being able to do more in this space, of course, as well. But the more you look at it, the more, as I just hinted at them with the ethics, you the more you look at it, the more you see things that need to be addressed. And if you sit, sit around waiting for it forever, you'll, you'll probably never act on it. So really at this stage, the main thing that's required is a logistical exercise, a call to action and bringing people together and sharing resources. And, and of course, people don't always want to do that. People sometimes want to take the glory or they want to uh, think that their way is a little bit better or a little bit different to someone else's. And we always understand that. And sometimes there's competitive advantage in doing that as well. Uh, but again, as, I, as I've mentioned a couple of times now, it's, it's just happening everywhere. I'm hearing the same conversations everywhere and people are starting to recognize it. And I think it's it's really important that people come together and pull resources, pull of energy, because it's a lot more efficient that way. So this group in Ghent, what's the, what's the aim of, of, of those guys? Well, they're embedded within a university. So they're, of course, they're, they are particularly interested in the research component, but of course that flows onto different types of technologies. They're also in the health area uh, as well. And so, I mean, this, what we're talking about today is probably just one small element of what they do. They're also interested in the research industry ecosystem and how universities can work um, most effectively with some of the stakeholders we've talked about today. And and I think that's a point worth emphasizing now as well. Out of all these stakeholders we've talked about, you could argue the universities have the most to gain by sorting their shit out. You can edit that part out in terms of <laughs> in terms of actually just... I'm not saying they've got more time than those other stakeholders, although they probably do, the individuals working at universities, but they've got more to gain for that. This is an opportunity for them to reimagine a little bit about the way that they interact with industry rather than the traditional model about 
we're going to embed a PhD student in a professional club and do some research. This is an opportunity where they can actually add value through the rigor that they have in their scientific training to actually provide value back to all these stakeholders we talked about in terms of understanding the product better, understanding the value from their product, understanding the risks associated with their product, and something we haven't talked about, understanding what might be coming next and what they're going to need to do to stay viable, to stay uh, of an appropriate quality uh, into the future. Which leads me on nicely, because it was a few months, well, it feels like years ago, but I, I can't imagine it was better. Who knows what happened over the last two years, but nine months ago, 12 months ago, I don't know, I contacted you because I'd had this <clears throat> frustration bubbling since my catapult days five or six years ago. And me having sponsored the podcast, fantastic sponsors who, who support this, been sports tech companies, and wanting to provide a little bit more transparency for those guys. And because of the work that you've done, you're involved in the FIFA stuff, came to you and um, and said, we should be, I feel like we should be doing, I should be doing something or I can do something with specific partners that can help with this and help understand the, again, using player tracking as, as the example, a bit more objective information so clubs can make more informed decisions versus who they trust on the sales from the sales guys or which marketing bump they believe the most so that was that was kind of where this <clears throat> this idea came from i came to you and 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 gave you that um bit of a spiel and it sounded like like you've just mentioned that people were having these discussions all around the world and whether they pulled together with a university or um, they collaborate with a few organizations and, and try to do something similar so the aim, and I'll let you put a little bit more meat on the bone from, from your angle, the aim from a sportsmith angle for me was to partner with the likes of yourself, pull in um, a, a certain category, whether that be force plate data or player tracking has been kind of done with FIFA anyway, so we kind of left that alone, but force plates was a was a was um, an obvious first step. And to actually evaluate objectively, without any bias for, for one company or that I'm a vild guy, I'm a hawking guy. No, 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 I'm just a force play understanding guy and try to provide this information on Sportsmith for practitioners to, to tap into to make a more informed decision. And thankfully, you, like I said a minute ago, you were um, very responsive and, and, and thought it was, a, it was a cool idea because it's been talked about. So I'd like for, for you just to kind of add on that from what, what that could potentially be from, from your side and how you would potentially offer value on, on that as well. And then I'll direct people, hopefully, to where they can um, express a bit of an interest in, in this, this project moving forwards. Well, I think you've done a pretty good job of articulating it. But I guess if I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into what it means to evaluate those particular types of technologies or any technology and it's something we're talking about off air in terms of what is the right word is it is it a, a quality of the device or a standard or a evaluation i mean none of the words really perfectly fit but the point is of course we can look at a uh, a piece of a technology like a force plate and provide as you said objective information on it but it's never really objective i mean we still need to make judgment calls about what we choose to look at and there's reliability, the validity, these really traditional terms that we, we hear all the time. Uh, but of course, one force plate might be very valid and reliable under one load condition and maybe not so much under another. And of course, technology companies are good at finding the bit that makes them, them look the best. And so, it's yes, it's coming together and providing an objective, somewhat objective framework, but it's also about industry engagement and providing somewhat of what we I guess what we'd call consensus. And I think the real value in having multiple people involved in deci designing a framework about how we would evaluate a piece of technology is that we do get what's out there in the literature. We do also get what's out there in the feeling, so to speak, or consensus from the crowd, which is not always good, but most of the time it's a pretty good indicator about what's going on and, and what's out there. And thereby we can come up with some kind of framework. And again, it's still not telling the end user that you have to use a certain particular piece of 
equipment. It's just saying, go into this with your eyes wide open. If it's a lot cheaper and it's 2% different to the best in the market, that's a decision that I, I don't think a university or I don't probably think yourself would, would be wanting to make for a particular organization. The role is to provide unbiased, objective information out there. And I think that's a way of doing it. And and of course, that's we're talking at a very uh, specific scale at the moment as well. There's all sorts of other things that come into mind. And I mentioned, I mentioned one of them then in terms of cost. Cost is obviously a major factor about why a lot of organizations decide to use a piece of technology. Uh, a really open question, which we've talked about a lot here is, is that important? Uh, are the user characteristics, are the feasibility, how easy a system is to use? Are those things that we should be rating as well? They're probably open questions that down the track are, are worth asking. But for the moment, of course, and, and along with other things like is the really high level things like is the company acting re- ethically and socially responsibly? These are really longer term things that are worth looking at. But uh, I know our conversation certainly was limited to things that are really we're not limited, delimited to just things that are, are worth starting at here in terms of some objective information uh, that's provided out to the the industry. And you know, I'm not I'm not going to uh, make a big deal of this being on your show, but I would say that uh, you know I really applaud you for taking the initiative here and getting on the front foot with it because I think it's really needed. And again, it's not a a clip from me to lots of other people by saying that, because as I said earlier, it's moved really quickly. And I think it's caught a lot of us off guard, just how pervasive some of these technologies have become. And particularly how how quickly they've come from just being confined to the lab. And all of a sudden they're out there in applied sport. Mm -hmm. And that was a big, just jumping on the back of that, that was a big thing for me was, and again, leaning on my leaning on my experience at Catapult, is is there any validation to this? Yes, you fold in the paper. It never gets read. They just want to tick. Practitioners, a lot of practitioners, just want to tick the box. Yes, uh, it's been through that scientific process. It's valid. It's reliable. I don't particularly want to read it. I ain't got particularly got that lot of time. It feels inaccessible. It feels complicated. It, it is compli- It's complicated, but I'm happy that it's been done. To the, to the flip side of getting a demo and seeing, oh, it's nice and shiny. It does, it, it visualizes the data in this specific, uh, this specific way. I can send it to a coach in that specific way. And almost going somewhere in between where it's, yes, it's, it's ticking off the valid and reliable stuff, but it's actually bringing it into a coaching conversation of, yeah, that's all good, but is it easy to use? And what is easy to use, what's easy to use for one person is not easy to use for another person. So it's trying to get this happy medium somewhere in between where it's coaching language. It's it's what these people and these practitioners value on a day-to-day basis and trying to evaluate that versus just leaving up to the universities to provide, um, provide validation that, like I say, is often just a, is it been done? Yes, great. I can use that product and it's up to me to decipher the rest. So it's helping people decipher the rest, I guess, is was where I was coming from in the first place. Yeah, sure. And I mean, the point you made then around the the subjective stuff, the things that are maybe not measured subjectively, but could be interpreted subjectively, of course, that's one of the great things down the track about your particular platform, that if there is an interest there from the community to pursue that and to start to look at those further factors some of which i referred to then you're in a position where you have that platform to be able to do that and that's that's really exciting and i know that's exciting for you but it's probably just equally exciting for for everyone else as well so it's not quite set up yet but it will be there'll be a landing page on on sportsmith for governing bodies for individuals and for sports tech companies just to show that they're interested so it'll be a very very quick form so their details can be shared with myself and sam and then we can um we can use that as a bit of a jumping off point to to formulate this idea and and move things forward so that's the bit of a call to action on on sportsmith it'll be super super clear probably a little um item at the top that people can get involved involved with email address name what kind of organization you're from or what kind of indi- individual you are. And then uh, and then we can go from there. But I'm super excited. It's one thing that I've wanted to do for a while. And in my little bubble, it's thinking, 
where the hell do I go with this? There's got to be someone out there who's doing something like this who can who can potentially partner with me on. And thankfully, you um, thankfully jumped at the chance to, to to be able to do that. So um, I'm super excited, and I'd like just as much input as possible to make this as applicable as possible to the practitioner. So any, like I say, any input from uh, all those three stakeholders is um, is really really appreciated. And I think it, it can just be it can be so so useful because that, like I say, I've been in situations where the whole process is confusing. You've got emails, you get bombarded with emails daily um, from this company or that company, uh, white papers sent, uh, articles sent, case studies sent, and you're like, where do I, where the hell do I go with all this? How do I decipher? Okay, I'll just go with the guy that I trust the most. I like him. And we'll spend the money with them, which is which is not to downplay that, but that is more often not the case. So it's objectifying all that information, easy to read, easy to visualize, and hopefully um, provide some value. So that's the aim, eh? It is. And something that shouldn't be lost on all this is it's, it's going to get more and more of it. So we've got to make a start. Gosh. And we've got to get going because there's going to be more types of technology not only more providers in the same categories but there'll be more types so we need to get started yeah absolutely well that'll be on sportsmith well by the time this this goes out of course but um not at time of recording so i'll, I'll make sure that's um that's super super clear where, where people can jump on board with that but thank you very much sam really appreciate your time and it's been a pleasure catching up with you again um and talking to you about this project over the last few months where can people find out more about you, more about the work that you've done? What's the best place? Probably social media. Probably Twitter is my uh, social media of choice. It's probably the only one I maintain. And uh, you've made me feel extremely guilty about my website, which has been partially developed for six months and still sitting there. And uh, I haven't even got the ability to promote that at this point. So social media will have to do for, moment, for the moment. Perfect. No, no, I don't feel bad. It's a, it's an absolute slog, <laughs> absolute slog keeping up with it and uh, and pestering everyone to, uh, to to contribute. So that's that's all good. But Sam, thank you very much. Super excited to um, to move forward this with this with you, and um, no doubt we'll be catching up very very soon. No, thank you for thinking of me, and I appreciate. It. I'm really excited to see the response that we get. Perfect. Thanks, mate.